In this video, we review a set of introductory remarks to the first law of thermodynamics. Now, the first law of thermodynamics uh, states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be transformed or transferred. Uh, something that is important uh, from a historical perspe perspective is to recognize that uh, the first law predates the quantum theory of matter, right? So by about 50 years or so. So uh, something that is actually quite important is to recognize that even though the people who came up with the first law had essentially no idea of uh, how a cell works or how protein structure is or DNA, uh, or how even uh, orbitals in, in, in atoms uh, work out, they were able to lay out that uh, first law of thermodynamics and, and importantly, uh, even after quantum theory came and explained what orbitals are, how the quantum theory of matter is, even when we were able to then understand uh, protein structure or DNA structure, those laws of thermodynamics, the first law, still applies. Uh, in the post-quantum world, right? So that tells you that, that the first law is universally true, still hasn't been, been proven wrong, even though our scientific understanding of the world is, in, is improving. All right, so great. The, um, uh, what we do then in the rest of this video is, is uh, uh, try to introduce some concepts that we're gonna be using throughout this uh, series of videos, uh, just again, as, as, as way of introduction. Generally, in thermodynamics, we're going to be interested uh, in dividing uh, the entire universe into just two parts, the system and the surroundings. And we're going to choose how this partition takes place, right? So uh, again, the entire universe is just going to divide and be divided into the system, which is what we're interested in, okay, and the surroundings, which is everything that is not the system. Okay, so what could be uh, the system then? Well, the system can be anything that you want. It could be maybe a gas inside a cylinder that can be uh, moved up and down, or it could be maybe a protein solution, or it could be an ice cube, it could be a cell, it could be a human, it could even be a planet, uh, right? So that's, that's the system, that's what we want to understand uh, in the life sciences. Now the surroundings will be the rest of the universe. Right, so notice that for most of the studies that we're going to be looking at, right, most of the systems that we're going to be looking at are going to be fairly small. So right, we're going to have maybe 20 grams of water, or maybe we're going to have uh, a mitochondrion, or maybe, uh, oh, I don't know, 20 milliliters of blood, or something like that. Right, that's the system. Now, the rest of the universe is the surroundings. So again, the first thing that, that, that should come to mind is that the surroundings are always going to be much, much, much greater than the system. And this will be important because even if a change in a system appears to be very, very large, so for example, take an ice cube and melt it, right? So, so your system is an ice cube and you apply enough energy to melt it into liquid water, that's a dramatic change for the system. For the surroundings, that change is actually infinitesimal. Right? Think about uh, uh, 20 miles away from this ice cube, that's still the surroundings. That surroundings doesn't care about, uh, really hasn't changed much uh, when, those, uh, when that ice cube has melted. Right? So again, uh, the surroundings are so huge that everything is really infinitesimal in the surroundings. Now, um, the, uh, again, we're going to be concentrating on the system mostly even though we're also going to be looking at the surroundings uh, in, you know, in specific sections of thermodynamics. But again, the focus is going to be in the system. So let's talk about the types of system that we're going to be encountering. Right? So when, I think, when you think about the system, there's going to be, in general, three types of system. We're going to have open systems, then we're going to have closed systems, and then isolated systems. All right, so what are the differences? between uh, uh, these ones. Well, open systems are those that can exchange uh, both mass with the surroundings and energy. Okay, so in open systems, uh, you exchange both mass and energy with the surroundings. Now, a human being would be an example of an open system where uh, we, we strongly exchange energy, right? When uh, we, for example, are sweating, 
right? We actually are uh, 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 radiating energy, or when we get very hot, we radiate energy to the surroundings. Or maybe we're cold, and we go out in the sunshine, we're actually getting energy from the surroundings into the system, into the system. right? So there's obviously energy transfer. But there's also mass transfer. Again, if we go back to the sweating example, right, when you put, put droplets of water in your skin, right, that water is evaporated uh, uh, and ends up in the surroundings. So you are also transferring mass. OK, so, so that's what an open system is. Now, let's think about a closed system, which are also going to be quite important for us. A closed system is one in which you can exchange energy with the surroundings, but there can't be any mass exchange. Okay, so examples of a closed system are going to be uh, very common as well. Uh, suppose where you have, that you have your maybe a gas inside a cylinder with a piston that can move up and down. Right, so if that piston is thermatic, and it will be in, in many of the problems that we're going to be working on, you can still transfer energy, right? You can apply here some sort of uh, heat bath, or maybe a Bunsen burner, or you can put this in the microwave and then uh, transfer energy uh, in and out of the system, but you will always have the same amount of gas inside that cylinder. So that is what is a closed system. Now, in an isolated system, what you actually would have is that there's neither mass exchange nor uh, energy exchange with the surroundings, right? So the idea would be to uh, uh, thermally isola uh, uh, insulate this closed system to make it isolated. Now, uh, isolated systems do not exist in reality because it's impossible to keep uh, energy from being exchanged between system and surroundings for an infinite amount of time. Uh, if you think about maybe uh, one of the ice boxes uh, that people use, right? Uh, that tends to be an isolated system initially if the, if the uh, lid is pretty hermetic, but after a couple of days, if you put a few, a few ice cubes in your ice box, they will melt away, right? Because getting those uh, isolated systems is, is almost impossible. You can't stop uh, easily energy transfer, at least for an infinite amount of time. So even though isolated systems really don't exist, uh, there are going to be a very useful limit for us. Uh, it will be a theoretical limit, uh, an extreme that we will uh, study to see uh, you know, how the, the laws of thermodynamic apply into those model systems, and then use that as a stepping stone to understand um, systems that we're more interested in, like open uh, or closed. Okay, so this is uh, the introductory remarks that we needed to get started with this first law of thermodynamics. In the next video, we get into uh, uh, the definition of the two ingredients of the first law, which are going to be work and heat.